I would like to hand things over to Dr. Chad Paco, um, a brilliant scientist, a uh, brilliant uh, and compassionate clinician, um, and all around nice guy who will uh, teach us about what squamous lung cancer is. Thank you, Jared. A little too many accolades there, but I appreciate that. Um, well, what I'm going to try and do is go through what I think of as what is lung squamous cancer. Um, and I'm going to start by saying we don't really know, but I'll tell you essentially what we do know, and I'll tell you things we don't know. Um, this is a picture actually of what lung squamous cancer looks like. Um, it's what we call a gross specimen, so that's literally a removed lung um, that has a tumor growing in it. And uh, it should be pretty obvious where it is, but if it's not, that's the surrounding tumor. And this is the airway. And I'll talk a little bit about where lung squamous begins, and that's uh, getting at the beginning of what we really understand about this cancer. Uh, this is a slide that you may be familiar with seeing. It's a statistic that's pretty remarkable, and it gets at how uh, important lung cancer is overall, um, and especially in relation to all other kinds of cancers. And I think anyone involved in lung cancer research or care for lung cancer patients, um, and certainly the patients and caregivers, really appreciate just how incredibly important this cancer is, um, and just the uh, discrepancy between how many occur in uh, lung cancer versus all the other cancers. So this is actually true throughout the world. This is the number one cancer killer throughout the world, not just America. And so this is what I was talking about. This is essentially the beginning uh, to get into what do we actually know about lung squamous cancer. Um, try and use the pointer here. So small cell lung cancer is pretty much only seen in people that smoke. Um, these are usually very heavy smokers, people who began smoking sometimes in their teens or early 20s. Um, and so if someone's told you uh, or someone that you know that they have small cell lung cancer, they really should uh, be someone that really has smoked a great deal of their lives. I'm going to skip over squamous for now and just talk about adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is something that involves what we call the lower airways. Um, and so there's different structures that are further down into the airway um, that we believe is where adenocarcinoma comes from. This also is an area that's controversial. Where does it actually arise? One thing I will point out is that over the years, we've seen a big shift from types of uh, squamous cancer being the predominant type of lung cancer to adeno. And we actually think um, that's because of the filters on cigarettes. And the filters actually aerosolize uh, the carcinogens deeper to the airway. So we think that the carcinogens are more depositing down here and causing more adenocarcinomas than squamous. In the past, you have more of a uh, kind of a tar and deposit in the upper airways. And that's where squamous comes from. And so in the past, we saw more squamous carcinoma because we think that the type of cigarettes people smoked um, led to the, the damage in the upper airway and not the lower airway. So essentially, this is where we think squamous comes from. Uh, this is certainly where most of the tumors arise. Um, and so this is, uh, as you can imagine, the air coming down into the lung. This is the beginning of the air coming down into the uh, lung and the airways. And this is where the tumors begin. This is what they look like under a microscope. Um, now this is what we would call classic squamous carcinoma. Um, and they, when you look at the pathology report, this is what we would expect to see, that these different proteins are positive and this one is negative. And this is highly oversimplified. It's actually common to see that sometimes this one will be negative and this one will be positive, but it looks like this. And it's complicated. And a lot of times pathologists will not agree on what's what. Um, and so I would actually say, you know, looking at this slide, it's important to be able to see well, what proteins are being called positive, uh, which things are being called negative, um, and how they know for sure this is squamous carcinoma, because there is a lot of distinction, which Jared will talk about, um, in terms of how we treat these patients. So what do we know about squamous carcinoma? This is a tricky slide to try and go in detail. What I'll actually start with is adenocarcinoma. And so when you hear about molecular profiling, which has really completely changed how lung cancer doctors think, um, when we think about adenocarcinoma, we kind of think of it in terms of a bunch of different slices of pies. And this blue slice of pie, which is unknown, continues to get smaller and smaller. And so what I'm getting at is essentially over time we're really getting to be able to characterize adenocarcinoma a lot better based on different DNA changes. Um, but the reason why I would say that adenocarcinoma is better understood is because oncologists know that when you look at uh, these different slices of pie, if you apply to a, a drug to these different problems, uh, which Jared will talk about probably some, um, we expect the tumors to shrink. And actually in squamous carcinoma, even though we see some of these abnormalities, 
there are no drugs, at least thus far, that actually when you apply a drug against it, the tumor will shrink. And so I would actually argue at this point in time, this is irrelevant. Um, I think um, intellectually it would be interesting to know why these tumors are growing, and it would be nice to know what DNA changes have occurred in squamous carcinoma. And I think it's really tough to pull ourselves away from what we understand about adenocarcinoma because we can uh, use this information to drive decision-making in adenocarcinoma. But let me show you a, a very big difference between squamous and adenocarcinoma. Um, before I get to that, I wanted to show this. So uh, Jared will probably talk a lot about immunotherapies. I will definitely cover some of that at the end. Um, one type of profiling that we can do, aside from just looking at DNA, is looking at the protein. So this is actually a picture of what we call immunohistochemistry, chemistry, and all the brown you're seeing is protein stain. And that's for PDL1. So you can see that squamous carcinomas, about half of them, staying positive for PDL1. Now, this picture makes it look very clear that there's PDL1 staining. I'll tell you, it's nowhere near as simple as this. Um, and this is a big area of research. Um, and so some of these cells here we would call negative. But if you look closely, there's some cells that look kind of brown. So would you call all those negative or positive? Well, these are clearly pretty strong. They're dark brown. And so we would call these positive. But this is a field that's evolving. So when you hear 50% positive, it's important to put that in context what that actually means. Um, and people are trying to understand that more. This is actually how I think about lung squamous carcinoma. Um, I think it's way, way too simple to just draw some pie chart uh, and say, well, this is the kind of lung squamous that you have. Um, and unfortunately, lung squamous is much more complex than we uh, and how we think about adenocarcinoma. Um, and so what I will point out is there's nowhere on here, and there's certainly no pie chart here, that actually is even looking at mutations. Uh, what this is actually looking at is ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is more like lung squamous than lung adeno. Um, and so lung squamous and ovarian cancer and a few other cancers have more similarities than lung adenocarcinoma. And so just because it comes from the lung and it's a tumor in the lung doesn't mean that when you look at the genomics of it, it's going to be the same. And so the point in showing this is that there's a lot more things going on than just DNA changes. There are things called microRNAs, things called methylation, things called copy number changes, and that's just beginning to uh, you know, touch the iceberg. It's, it's a huge problem, and it's much more complex than just being able to find what we call a driver mutation, as we see in adenocarcinoma. Um, and so I think that's where the advent of immunotherapies and bringing that to the clinic is going to be really important to discuss today. Um, for sake of time, I'm just going to cover this quickly, and that is that basically about 85% of patients get lung cancer from either smoking in the past or currently smoking. Only about 10 to 15% of people get lung cancer and they never smoke. However, it's very rare for someone with lung famous to get lung cancer without smoking. And so you really have to question that diagnosis. These are some of the secondary causes of lung cancer. So, uh, you know, people typically know smoking is a big cause, but secondhand smoke is a possibility. We know that from some of the airline attendants uh, that uh, flew in the 70s and 80s. They were exposed to a lot of smoke, um, and that's when you're allowed to smoke in the airplane. But other things like radon gas, um, this is a natural gas released from some of the soils throughout the country. So in North Carolina and other areas have high amounts of this. It's something you can test for free in your home. Uh, and I listed a few others. I will say genetic susceptibility to lung cancer is extremely rare, um, and I believe only adenocarcinoma has that been shown. Um, and I believe it's uh, more of a, a pattern we've seen in Caucasians, uh, and uh, again, it's uh, exceptionally rare. Um, and so I don't believe there's any evidence of that in lung squamous. So are there any better or worse choices of chemo for squamous lung cancer? Jared, will you cover any of that? So that's actually going to be covered in the next talk. Uh, excellent question, and the answer is yes. So this is the first time that a lot of the folks are seeing how to text them a question. Uh, so maybe give folks a, a, a minute or two to answer that if there's another. Sure. So I'll wait for the next question, but to briefly answer that, I know Jared will cover that some. That's actually something we didn't really know until a few years ago. In general, adenocarcinoma and squamous carcinoma, they would receive the same types of chemotherapies, and in general, really the same type of treatment. Um, but in terms of chemotherapies for squamous lung cancer, we know now we now know that there's a chemotherapy called pemetrexid that's not that effective for squamous and it's more effective for adenocarcinoma. Um, and so in general, we would not give someone with squamous lung cancer pemetrexid. Um, and there's actually a few other options for chemotherapies uh, beyond just pemetrexid. 
Um, I will say the, what we call the backbone, which would be the core of chemotherapy that we would pretty much always give someone with lung cancer, is what we call a platen. So we call it a platen doublet, meaning either cisplatin or carboplatin. Um, and essentially that is a must. So platen doublets, meaning the doublet means some other chemo paired with it. Um, and so in this context would be cisplatin or carboplatin plus some other chemo. And like I said, for lung squamous, we would not give phenotrexid as that second choice.